Hey guys, what's up? It's Taz on Saga. This is going to be another, uh, you know, gun review, as I do in my usual fashion. This one goes out particularly to Josh Sapsford, um, who's really been pestering me ever since uh, he grabbed me this gun at uh, War and Peace Show to do a review on it. Really enjoying it so far, and uh, here's your video. This goes out to anyone who wants to know a bit more about the pistol, so jumping straight into it. What you're looking at is the Russian... Tokarev Model TT33 uh, semi-automatic pistol. Very iconic pistol and uh, I'm going to talk loads about it in this video and you'll have lots of nice uh, close-ups. If you just want to know more about the pistol um, then go for it. This pistol popped up as a result of uh, the Russian the Russian army basically wanted to update its sidearms in 1930. Uh, they were currently using at that time the uh, M1895 Nagant revolver. That's quite a well-known gun as well. The only trouble with it, obviously, was it was a revolver. So uh, it used a special gas seal cartridge. And it wasn't like a break-open design like the Webley. So once you'd fired it, you know, the the, uh, the six rounds or however many it held, you had to um, sort of use an ejector rod to manually poke them all out. And you could only load them in one at a time. You couldn't use, like, you know, the uh, the speed loader, which they have with the, uh, the Webleys and whatnot. So it was just quite a time-consuming process to reload it. It's not terribly practical in battle. Uh, there were sort of uh, doubts about the cartridges, stopping power as well, um, and accuracy. So they wanted something that was just a little bit more effective, you know, in the field. And uh, when they were holding these trials in 1930, there were quite a few pistols that were submitted, as they would be. And uh, that's when Fedor Tokarev, who designed this pistol, popped up with his nice TT-30, which is the predecessor to this gun. They really sort of liked it and uh, they decided to accept it for uh, military use. It was adopted in 1931. Although almost immediately, even though it began production, they uh, made some changes to the um, the barrel, the disconnector, the trigger the fr and the frame and uh, some other pieces. Just to simplify manufacturing as the Russians really liked to just get things as simple as possible. And uh, the pistol was redesignated uh, TT-33. Obviously, it didn't see like any massive military action until uh, particularly World War II, obviously, which started for the Russians in 1941. This pistol was mainly, you know, just as most pistols were back in uh, World War II um, and the and uh, the wars before that. They mainly issued to uh, you know commanders, uh, particularly uh, officers in the Red Army and uh, some junior lieutenants and uh, some various other ranks. The TT-33 quickly earned a reputation as being a very reliable pistol and uh, similar to a lot of Russian weapons, uh, most famously known the, how much the abuse the AK-47 can take. Uh, the Tokarev is pretty similar, it can take a lot of neglect, it can be to the point where the finish is all gone and it's rusty and it will keep firing and it was very loved by the troops that used it. The Germans also made uh, good use of any captured examples as obviously the average soldier was not issued a pistol. The Germans were using the Luger and later on the uh, the Walther P38 and uh, <coughs> of course the Luger is not known for being reliable in dirty conditions so as with uh, a lot of a lot of German troops if there were any sort of enemy weapons that were better than their own they'd often you know just pick them up because uh, that was just the way they sort of did things back then. If they could get hold of a pistol I don't see why they wouldn't have and uh, of course there were reports of uh, Germans picking these up, PPSHs, the Germans could actually use their own ammunition in it. I'll talk more about the ammunition later. After World War II ended, obviously ended with the Russian victory on the Eastern Front, and uh, this pistol was sort of, a lot of these were kind of sold off after 1952 because it was replaced with the uh, the Makarov, which is a 9mm automatic pistol in 1952. So a lot of these were just sort of sold off to other countries. Um, a lot of them ended up with North Korea, um, China, and later on Vietnam. China actually produced their own version of this called the uh, the Type 54. So you can sort of tell the differences. The the uh, the Chinese model will have sort of, if you don't have the observations, they look different. The Star will also not have the CCCP and some of them have external safety. Yugoslavia made their own version. They had the M57 which is uh, very similar but has a 9 round magazine and the grips are tiny bit longer to accommodate that extra cartridge. The Romanians also made their own version, the TTC. Like a lot of them do have, some of them were um, made with manual safeties. A lot of the ones that get imported into the US for, um, you know, their regulations, they have to have a uh, manual safety on, which is usually located here or here somewhere. In the Vietnam War, these were often found in the, found in the hands of uh, the Viet Cong and uh, the NVA as well, the North Vietnamese Army. But uh, they had a lot of these lying around, a lot of World War II Russian surplus weapons and German stuff, and pretty much anything they could get their hands on. 
the VC did not really have a standard issue this and a standard issue that. They just basically had a whole collection of stuff. Although they repl officially replaced it with the Makarov, not all of them these were actually got rid of. They were still being used in the Russian army for years and years after the Makarov replaced it. When it was officially replaced, there had been roughly 1,700,000 manufacturers, so that's close to 2 million overall of the Russian TTs that were built. I don't know from what year that spans to, but these are actually still in service today. Apparently the Pakistan police still use these. See, they're very popular with militia groups around the world. So that's a brief bit of the history, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the features now. Now you often hear a lot of talk about how similar the TT-33 is to the 1911. That is true, partially. There are a lot of similarities, mainly in uh, the operating mechanism and how the, uh, the position of where things are on the pistol. Although externally it does share a lot in common with the FN model 1903, which is a blowback operated pistol designed by John Browning. Although the TT-33 is not blowback, it uses uh, what's known as J John Browning short recoil system, which he designed uh, for the 1911. And uh, that sort of system has been copied by guns ever since. Most pistols are generally short recoil. The dead giveaway is when you have uh, a pistol which has the barrel sort of mounted to the frame. That's how you can tell a blowback pistol. A barrel which is uh, separate and can be removed from the slide is generally how you recognise a short recoil operated pistol. To load the pistol, what you would then do normally with your magazine loaded is insert it into the, uh, the pistol and cycle the uh, slide to chamber around. This piece here is what's known as the slide catch or the slide lock. It basically locks the slide to the rear by fitting into this groove. When you have an empty magazine like this and you fire the last round, what will normally happen when the gun's working correctly is uh, the slide will lock back, which means you can see into the, uh, the magazine of the chamber area that the gun is unloaded. Like this. You can see that there's uh, no ammunition in the gun. When the uh, magazine is actually loaded, you'll be able to see a round in the magazine ready to be chambered like this. One of the neat design features of the Tokarev is uh, if you've got an empty magazine, say if you uh, eject an empty magazine and you accidentally pull out a magazine from your pouch which is already empty and you don't realise, you shove it in in a panic, you cannot release the slide. This lets you know that the magazine is actually empty. So at least that way you don't release the slide, um, you know, without this feature. If you release the slide, you think your gun's loaded, you go to fire it and you find it's empty. Um, I mean, the chances of that happening are quite minimal, but it does account for that. Uh, the slide lock is basically pushed up by the magazine when it's uh, not got a round in it, so this part exposes and just basically pushes it up. You can also lock it manually by simply putting the slide back and pushing it into this notch. To release the, uh, the slide once you have a loaded magazine in, you can either pull it like this, or you can just release it with the thumb here. This here is the hammer of the weapon. This is what strikes the rear of the firing pin, which will then uh, puncture the primer. You can see here these ones are inert, so they're already struck uh, to puncture this uh, primer, which of course detonates the powder and fires the, uh, the bullet off down the barrel. When I cock the hammer, you can see the back here. You have the rear of the firing pin, which is still intact, despite the fact this is deactivated. Of course, it does not protrude out of the front. So when you pull the trigger, that releases the hammer, hits the back of the firing pin, discharging your round. Every time you fire the pistol, of course, the uh, slide will cycle and uh, recock the hammer. You do not have to do it manually, say, as you would with a single action revolver. Every time you fire, the slide will jump back, which will recock it. To unload the pistol, it's just like any other. You want to keep your finger off the trigger and then point in a safe direction. Release the magazine. You'll see there are some rounds in the magazine, in that, of course. And then normally there'd be a round in the chamber still, so you just draw it to the back, eject the round in the chamber and then you'd have an unloaded gun. Now a common thing that's often mentioned with the Tokarev is uh, how wobbly the triggers actually are. They do have quite a lot of play in them. Um, the reason being that the Russians were never sort of crazy on pre precision engineering. They often make their weapons with uh, exceptionally loose tolerances. One of the benefits of this is um, if you're in sort of really freezing weather you don't have parts freezing up as easily and also you can like get dirt in your weapon because there's a lot of space between parts it won't sort of affect it as much as say a weapon with tight tolerances. The magazine holds eight rounds you can of course eight plus one and uh, these magazines are a single stack type they're not double stacks so they've got a very slim profile which also gives the uh, the toker of grip quite a slim profile. You notice that if you ever hold a pistol that has a, uh, say, like a Glock 17 or a SIG, 
which has a double stack magazine which holds about 15 to 18 rounds. You'll sort of feel that the grip is a lot wider. It's quite a slim profile on the Tokara. And um, of course these magazines are, you know, they can be disposable, they're cheap to make. Um, they've got a good spring in them. It goes in nice and firmly. Not all the mags will fit perfectly, but you simply just stick it in and push it till it clicks. Quite simple. Of course to release it, just press the button on the side and that releases your magazine. You can see there that my gun is dated 1945. The slide does not actually match the frame because on top um, it's got another date of 1940. You've got the Soviet star there and the serial number. This is the cartridge that the Tokarev TT-33 is chambered for. It's commonly referred to as the 762 Tokarev or the 762 by 25 mm It's directly copied off the German 763 by 25 Mauser round, which was originally used in the, uh, the Mauser C96 pistol. That was before they changed it to 9 mm For a comparison, here you have a 9mm on the left and a 45 ACP on the right. The order in which you're looking is basically the order of uh, you know, muzzle energy and stopping power. We have the 9mm, it's, slightly, uh, it's a slightly shorter case, it's 9x19, so of course uh, it comes up slightly short against the 7.62. The actual round is slightly heavier and uh, slightly larger and it's typically a full metal jacket. This was the most, this was sort of a, the common round used in the German Luger and the Walther P38. Very, very common round, the 9mm. It's obviously it's still used today. One of the most common pistol rounds there is. The 7.62 round has slightly better penetration, the 7.62x25, than the 9mm, mainly because it's higher velocity. Uh, it's, this is also the round that's used in the Russian PPSH-41 and the PPS-43 submachine guns. Uh, the PPSH-41 fires about, you know, 900 rounds a minute, so, uh, it's pretty devastating when you've got 900 of these coming out at you. They will penetrate sort of thick clothing. Uh, there was a slight problem with the, uh, the 45, uh, where uh, you could be firing at someone, you know, with relatively thick winter clothing, say in, uh, you know, the Korean War against uh, the Chinese or whatnot. And um, it wouldn't penetrate their clothing uh, long di longer distances, mainly because the round is you know, it's quite a heavy round, so it's slower. You know, the... Uh, the, cut, the actual case doesn't hold as much power to propel it to the same velocities as, uh, say, a 7.62 would. Mainly because the bullet is about 230 grains, so it's a bit heavier. However, the 45 does undoubtedly have the most stopping power out of the three. Uh, there's not really any question about that. The 762 by 25 is just sort of a good medium power round, and it will penetrate thick clothing better. So will the 9mm, but uh, this one tops it for a definitely penetration. Another thing that really differs the uh, the 762 by 25 against the 45 ACP and the 9 mm are because these two cartridges are just you know they have basic cases which you'll see in most pistols they're just like a straight wall cartridge. The 762 by 25 has a bottleneck so it gives you a little bit more velocity. The rounds are loaded into the magazine just like any other. I've got five rounds here to demonstrate. You simply insert them into the top at the front first and then you slide them back pretty much the basic deal. Very easy to do once you keep the inside of the magazine clean and um, of course when the uh, the gun's feeding it's uh, pushing them out and there's your five round. Like most pistols of the era the Tokarev TT-33 was usually issued with its holster. The holster for the TT is a leather type it also comes with the uh, the lanyard you'd wear this on the uh, the officer's belt obviously which would go through these two loops and obviously when there's a belt through it, this would stop this from coming off once you open the, uh, it's basically just a little, uh, like a belt there, you just pull that, that comes off. And uh, this shows your pistol. Of course you come, of course you have the pistol, and this is where the lanyard attaches, there's just a little hook on there. You can, uh, of course, squeeze that to get it off, and it slides right off. So that pops in there nice and neat, that just sort of slides right down. Here you've got a spare compartment for a, um, a magazine, uh, standard uh, 8 round single column, as usual. That just fits nice and snugly in there. On the left side, you've got the uh, the cleaning rod, which is obviously for swabbing the barrel. In here, you'd place like a patch, or which is I presume how they did it, and you just sort of uh, rotate it whilst going through the barrel, just to give the barrel a little swab out. That fits in a nice little uh, compartment here, which slides down. The chances it'll fall out when the uh, it's closed is very unlikely, since you've sort of sort of holding it in at the top here. So it's uh, it's a nice holster. Nice and simple to use, just buttons right over like that. 
the lanyard is quite long, and uh, the pistol on the uh, the height of the average height of me at least, the pistol will fall down just past your knee, and then it will tug. So the idea is that if you drop your pistol in combat or something, it's never more than say two feet away from you at any given time, as long as you've still got it attached to the lanyard. So you can sort of you can drop the pistol on the ground, and it will give you a tug. So that'll let you know that your pistol's fallen out of your holster. This is not really going to come undone, but it's just say if you're if you're running with your pistol and then you suddenly get engaged into hand-to-hand, -to -hand, you don't have to go back and look for your pistol because it's right next to you because uh, the lanyard has keep, kept hold of it. So it's just a way of let, um, making sure the pistol doesn't you know get further away than two feet, so it's always within arm's reach. It's a nice feature. These are very common today as well. They're often done in like a cord now, uh, rather than leather. But this, this holster is full leather of course and very nice stitching on it, very nice quality. And this one's probably not even issued because it does look sort of too nice. Disassembly of the TT-33 is uh, very very similar to the 1911. First thing you want to do is uh, of course uh, remove the, um, the magazine. And you want to slide, pull the slide to the rear to check that there's no round in the chamber. Obviously this being deactivated doesn't matter. But i just show you for the, the, uh, for the sake of... Uh, trying to prove a point thing, turn the pistol over and you'll see here there is a um, a little catch which holds the uh, the slide lock in. What you basically do is you take the rounded end of the magazine and you just pull out. Once you've done that basically the slide catch will be popping out one side so just use the magazine and push down on that part ever so slightly. Then you want to pull it to the back and you better push it with your finger and it will pop straight out. Some of them may be stiffer than others so I use something to pop it out with come straight out like that. that you'll be able to um, pull the uh, the slide out. Keep your hand under it though, otherwise the recoil spring will pop out. So you want to keep it under like that as you remove it. That will drop out. When you see this piece here, you basically, just like every other pistol, slide the lock to the back and just push down on it very gently. And the whole uh, spring assembly with the, uh, the main spring will pop out like that. Here you've got the uh, the recoil spring, the recoil uh, spring guide. And this is an interesting part which they added here on the Tokarev. Uh, this whole rear unit where the hammer is, is completely removable. It just slides slightly forward and out. Um, so if a piece of this was broken, instead of disassembling the whole thing and replacing the part, you could just take this whole unit out, chuck it and get a new one. So it was a lot quicker way to uh, you know, sort of repair things in the field. The slide is just left with uh, the barrel on the barrel bushing. What you want to do is you want to rotate this 180 degrees. I just pull straight off. Very similar to 1911. Then you push up on the barrel which unlocks it. You want to make sure this little link is down if it's up. Just move it down. And uh, you can then uh, slide the barrel out like that. Those are all the pieces. The slide itself is where the locking lugs are coming. Now I hate to look at the left side of the barrel but you can see there where it's been mucked about with. <laughs> just to prove it is deactivated for the sake of the video. The way the barrel works basically is uh, this link is what the, um, the slide catch goes through. So when you're sort of sliding that in, you'll notice that the barrel is not completely in line with the slide to start with. It will drop in when it gets to the end, like that. The reason for this is, is if I try and pull the barrel out, it won't because it's locked. When you pull the slide back, that, that will um, basically be holding on this part. So when you pull it, where the, um, the actual slide catch is going through the frame, that will hold the barrel where it is, so the slide will have, so that will sort of pull it at an angle like that, so it can uh, unlock itself. On top of the barrel here is uh, where the lugs are. These are the actual, these are the actual locking lugs right here. These are what fits into the corresponding uh, grooves inside. So that's how it basically locks. And of course, when it unlocks, those pop out of the way, allowing the, uh, the barrel to move out. It's very similar to a 1911. It's just a basic sort of um, recoil operated system. Inside you've got the frame, you know, the, uh, the trigger unit is pretty bare, it's just a basic, you know, machine piece. Once you put the, uh, the unit back in, it just slides in these little grooves. Some changes to this piece were made when they changed from the uh, TT30 to the TT33. So uh, they simplified some parts of that, the disconnector, um, which causes this piece on the, the bottom there. That's a very simple unit. It's a very nice feature that they, um, you know, allow this to be removed. Speeds up field repairs and everything. When the, uh, the magazine's inserted into the pistol, like I showed you with those cartridge guides, it comes straight up on the top there, so that sort of just keeps things in line. Um, very good, uh, very good system.
those are all the main components to a TT33 so now I'm going to reassemble the pistol uh, off camera otherwise you will be sat here watching this video all day so that's been the look at the Tokarev TT33 pistol hope you like it guys and I hope you enjoyed watching it as much as I uh, enjoyed making it it's a very nice pistol, very nice example of this and uh, I've really enjoyed giving it a good clean up so uh, please rate, comment, subscribe, tell me if you liked the video and tell me what you think of the, uh, the new camera angles as well so um, thanks a lot for watching guys